We talked last night about these constructs, science and religion, and what I argued then was that the ideas we have about science and religion are essentially modern ones. Our conception of religion dating from the 17th century and our conception of science from the 19th century. Um, and as, uh, we also said that j just as uh, forgetting is a crucial part of a nation's identity, as Ernst Renan reminds us, so historical, historical amnesia about the categories science and religion is integral to the idea that science and religion are distinct things. Now, for many people, a key aspect of the identity of science is that not merely is it separate from religion, but that it is in opposition to religion. Uh, and these two elements have been written into the history of religion, and, and in essence, they, they give us a mythical past about science and religion, where from the moment of science's inception in the West, it has been opposed to religion. Now, in a moment, we're going to look at this construction of a mythical past of the history of science and religion, but let me just give you a very general idea of what we're going to talk about this evening. And we've just got these three areas. If last night I said that religion and science were modern constructions, the question we're looking at today is, what on earth did these people in the past who we regard as having done science, how do they conceptualise their activities? So when the ancient Greeks were formally studying the natural world, if they weren't doing science, what were they doing? What were the groups that we regard as religious, say the early Christians, if they weren't engaged in religion, how did they conceptualise the activities that they were engaged in? So that, in essence, is the question that we're going to be exploring tonight. And so we're going to start with this question of science in antiquity, question mark. Now, the history of science, on one very common understanding, has three distinct stages. Science is said to have had its origins in Greek antiquity, when the philosophers first broke away from the myths of their forebears and they sought rational explanations for natural phenomena. Science then suffered a significant setback when Christianity got underway and it went into decline in the Middle Ages and then was finally resurrected in the 17th century with the scientific revolution. It achieved this success by breaking away from religion and it set out then on its progressive path to the present. Now in this version of events, the honour of having founded science is usually conferred upon the philosopher Thales uh, of Miletus. Uh, that's a, a port city in what is now Western Turkey. And there, well, we don't know what he looked like, but he, here's someone's uh, idea of what he looked like. The characteristic features of his thought on account of which he is honoured with having uh, founded science include a rejection of supernatural explanations, a search for unitary natural principles, and a willingness to engage in rational debate about alternative conceptions of the world and its operations. Western science was thus said to have been born amongst the ancient Greeks and developed by them into a state of some sophistication. With the fall of Rome and the rise of Christianity, however, the fortunes of science waned. The leading intellects in medieval Christendom directed their mental energies towards theology uh, and had little time for the systematic study of nature. But with the Renaissance and the scientific revolution, the aims and ideals of ancient science were reborn. Although the scientific doctrines of such 17th century figures as Galileo, Boyle and Newton were different from anything that had come before, these men were regarded as having investigated nature with the same spirit uh, that had motivated the endeavours of their Greek forebears. So these individuals, Galileo, Newton, et al, laid the new foundations for the sciences, and on these foundations rest the remarkable accomplishments of subsequent generations of scientists, which would in, were to include such luminaries as Darwin uh, and Einstein. Now the key moments in this history uh, this large-scale history are the, the birth of science amongst the ancient Greeks, its decline with the advent of Christianity, and its rebirth in the early modern period. The scientific revolution of the 17th century is the pivotal event in these histories, for not only does it look back to the ethos of ancient Greek investigators of nature, but it also looks forward to the impressive achievements of modern science. 
the eminent Cambridge historian Herbert Butterfield had this vision of history in mind when he famously remarked that the scientific revolution, quote, outshines everything since the rise of Christianity and reduces the Reformation and Renaissance to the rank of mere episodes. And as for the progenitors of science, Butterfield was happy to concede that, quote, natural science itself came to the modern world as a legacy from ancient Greece. And Butterfield, of course, was quite favourably disposed towards Christianity. Nonetheless, that was his judgment. Now, one of the very interesting characteristics of this view of science and its history is that from its very inception, science is placed in a particular relationship to religion. What makes the speculations of Thales and his Milesian school scientific is that they represent a definitive break with prevailing mythological or religious explanations of natural phenomena. In these narratives, science, even at its birth, is distinguished by its capacity to provide alternative and more rational accounts of the cosmos than those offered by religion and mythology. Now, the second phase of these histories similarly places science in a particular relation to religion. Classical culture is often described, or in the past, was described as having lost its nerve or having degenerated into an age of anxiety. And this paved the way for the rise of the mystery religions and eventually the success of Christianity. For their part, patristic and medieval Christian authors were said to have associated Greek science with paganism and thus to have discouraged its practice. Their attentions were firmly fixed not on the physical operations of the present world, but on fulfilling requirements necessary for salvation in the next. As a consequence, science is said either to have been hindered by or ignored by the church fathers and their successors in the medieval age of faith. By implication, the scientific revolution of the 17th century was accomplished only by overcoming the religious prejudices of the previous age. And the notorious example of Galileo's confrontation with the Inquisition seemed to confirm this view of things and the fact that the rise of science in the modern period was accompanied by the secularisation of European society counted as further evidence uh, of a generally negative relation between science and religion. Now, historians of science have largely abandoned this narrative uh, its central features, nonetheless, continue to exercise a tenacious hold on many accounts of science and its history. And I'll just give you an example. In one of his last essays, uh, Karl Popper makes this remark, and we have here all of the classical elements of the story that I've told you. The scientific tradition begins with the Ionian philosophers uh, in Greece. It died when it was suppressed by this victorious and intolerant Christianity, missed and mourned through the Middle Ages, and then revived again with the Renaissance uh, and found its fulfilment in Newton. Now, to give you another couple of more, even more recent examples, the popular science writer Paul Davies declares in one of his most recent books that religion was, quote, the first systematic attempt to explain the universe, but then Along came science, which cast its explanations, quote, in terms of impersonal forces and natural physical processes rather than the, than the activities of purposeful supernatural agents. Davies goes on to explain that whenever religious and scientific explanations come into conflict, uh, inevitably it was science that emerged victorious. Uh, one final example, without wishing to labour the point too much in Brian Bunch's recent survey of the history of science and technology, we're again informed that Western science began with Thales of Miletus. He and his successors were, quote, the first to believe that the universe could be understood using reason alone rather than mythology or religion. As a consequence of these ideas, the ancient Greeks established institutions in which individuals, quote, pursued science in somewhat the way universities do today. The advent of Christianity in late antiquity brought an end to these institutions, but science was revived during the scientific revolution. Now, what is wrong with this picture? Well, I think part of the problem is one that I've already alluded to, and that is to do with our modern conception of science. The fact is that the ancient Greeks had neither activities nor occupations that are directly equivalent to our term science or scientist. Those who concerned themselves with the phenomena of nature were then known as natural philosophers and their activities fell within or under the rubric of philosophy. 
Now, it's certainly possible to project back modern notions of science onto their activities, but it does violence to the relations of natural philosophy with other aspects of ancient culture, such as poetry, mythology, and religion. Natural philosophy was then an integral part of philosophy itself. This realisation, however, is only helpful if we understand that ancient philosophy has only the most tenuous connection with the subject matter now taught in university departments of philosophy, and particularly those in the Anglo-American tradition. Philosophy then entailed the pursuit of wisdom or happiness, and you can make up your own minds about whether either of those are much in evidence in modern philosophy departments. <laughs> but my claim would be that ancient philosophy was, to use Pierre Ardo's apt phrase, then a way of life, or about the pursuit of a way of life. And this is a thesis that Ardo has developed in this book, where you can see from the subtitle, Spiritual Exercises from Socrates to Foucault, he's arguing that philosophy is essentially about spiritual exercises. And he repeats this thesis in a more recent book, What is Ancient Philosophy? Now, the connection between the study of nature and the philosophical life is provided by the conviction that there is a moral order built into the structure of the cosmos. The universe provides a model of the good for those engaged in the philosophical quest for the good life. So to take a key example, Plato in The Republic says that the philosopher must engage in the contemplation of heavenly order in which, quote, all things move according to reason so that the philosopher might conform to the same pattern and lead a life, quote, that is orderly and divine. Here we have Plato depicted in Raphael's famous School of Athens. He is clutching the Timaeus, the work throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance for which he was most famous. In the Timaeus, Plato repeats this idea, and here it is, the motions that are naturally akin to the divine principle within us are the thoughts and revolutions of the universe. So each man should follow these by learning the harmonies and revolutions of the universe so that having assimilated them, he may attain to that best life that the gods have set before mankind. So this is why we need to become familiar with the natural world. Now, in addition to the moral significance of the cosmos, the pursuit of mathematics <coughs> was similarly regarded by some at least as contributing to the moral and intellectual formation of the individual philosopher. Plato thus contends that mathematics is, quote, a divine art that raises human beings to a godlike state. Now, for all his differences with Plato, Aristotle agreed that the cosmos was characterised by a particular harmony and order and that the natural parts of human beings corresponded to parts of the universe. Like Plato, he also associated mathematics with, quote, the true and the good and contended that the goal of philosophy was to secure the kinds of moral attributes that would make one, quote, supremely happy. Now, almost 400 years later, the Stoic philosopher Seneca is going to repeat elements of this conception of philosophy. So philosophy, he says, moulds and builds the personality, orders one's life, regulates one's conduct, shows one what one should do, what one should leave alone. Now, it's almost a cliche that for the Stoics, the good life was a life pursued in accordance with nature. The individual life is good, said Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, when it is in harmony with nature. So to make the big generalisation, we might say for the ancients, natural philosophy itself was, was subservient to these essentially moral, we might say spiritual ends. One way to see the force of this is to think about how the ancients divided up uh, philosophical activity or sciences, we might call them very broadly. And here's the classification that we find in Plato and the Stoics, a threefold distinction between ethics, logic, and physics or natural philosophy, and these two are essentially synonymous. But ethics is the most important of these, and the other two, in a, in a way, are subservient to it. Here's Aristotle's threefold distinction, which is rather different. Um, theology has a very special sense for Aristotle. It doesn't certainly doesn't map onto our conception of theology, but nonetheless, there it is. For Aristotle, these sciences are distinguished according to their respective subject matters, the most elevated subject matters being those of theology, and the things of theology are eternal, immovable, and separable from matter. At the complete opposite end of the scale, uh, the opposite in every respect are the objects of natural philosophy, 
which are finite, movable, and inseparable from matter. And then between these, we have mathematics. Um, and I've got a few question marks there. Aristotle was never quite sure whether mathematical entities could be abstracted or were separate from matter. But at any rate, the objects of mathematics fall between the objects of natural philosophy and theology. Now, when we look at these classifications, we tend to think of these more along the lines of disciplinary divisions. So we divide the disciplines according to their objects. But certainly, the, the commentators in Aristotle would take a rather different view, or a view perhaps in addition to this, and that these sciences or th these branches of philosophy were regarded as stages through which the individual would pass. And so we begin with the finite, sensible objects of natural philosophy. We proceed to the middle ground of mathematical objects before proceeding to the study of theology. And so we have there not merely three disciplines, but three stages in the philosophical formation of the individual. Um, right. So the Hellenistic philosophical schools tended to adhere to this kind of model. The Stoics believed that the two sciences of physics and logic ultimately served the third science of ethics. In Stoic philosophy, the person who understands the operations of the cosmos will also know how to conduct themselves within that cosmos. Philosophical activity, including the study of nature, was thus directed towards moral formation. Now, even the Epicureans, who in some circles still have a reputation as hedonists and no-nonsense naturalists, subscribe to the idea of the science of nature having a moral aim. So Epicurus insisted that natural philosophy was not to be pursued for its own sake, but was intended to secure happiness. So his recommendation, quote, that constant occupation in the investigation of the science of nature, he proposed, was in order, quote, to secure the greatest serenity in life. More specifically, the divisions of the sciences for Epicurus corresponded to the aspects of the soul that were to be brought under control. So we pursue logic, says Epicurus, in order to discipline our judgment. We pursue physics to discipline desire and ethics to discipline the inclinations. Okay. So the tendency to fuse what we would call the scientific, the ethical and the religious becomes even more pronounced in the philosophical schools of late antiquity. So the Neoplatonist Porphyry, who's third century, uh, was typical in his insistence that philosophy was to do with neither, quote, the accumulation of arguments nor the profession of learned knowledge, but was about transforming one's own life. His disciple Simplicius offered a similar view about the progression from the study of the material things through to the contemplation of uh, higher things. Here is his explanation of what physics is useful for. I've given you part of the quote there. Let me give you the full one here. Physics, he says, is useful in the affairs of daily life because it provides principles of technology such as medicine and mechanics, understood above all as the art of manufacturing machines of war, because it contributes then, he goes on to say, to leading the superior part of the soul, which is the intellect, towards its perfection, for which the study of theology is particularly valuable. It's an auxiliary for moral virtues, a ladder that leads towards knowledge of God and ideas, and finally incites us to piety and acts of thanksgiving towards God. Now, Simplicius, we should note, was no friend of Christianity, in spite of these pious sentiments. On the contrary, Note also that Simplicius believes that physics has a use. It's useful, and he lists the uses in order of increasing importance. Now, an emphasis on the utility of the sciences has always been part of their justification. But as we're going to see in the fifth lecture, conceptions of what counts as useful change over time. And this is what's changed in our justifications of uh, why we pursue physics. Indeed, in the modern period, obviously, the sorts of priorities we see in Simplicius have actually been inverted. Now, as a final witness to the moral and theological orientation of the study of nature in antiquity, I offer Ptolemy. We know Ptolemy formulates the wonderful mathematical system that lasts from the first century to the 17th that explains how the cosmos operates. But in the very first part of the Almagest where Ptolemy sets out this scheme, here is his justification for the pursuit of mathematical astronomy. 
So he says, with regard to virtuous conduct uh, in practical actions and character, this science, mathematical astronomy, above all things can make men see clearly from the constancy, order, symmetry and calm that are associated with the divine, it makes followers, lovers of this divine beauty, accustoming them and reforming their natures, as it were, to a spiritual state. So the goal of astronomy, as Ptolemy understands it, is thus moral and spiritual formation. Ptolemy's conception of astronomy is thus wholly in keeping with the tradition established way back in Plato's Timaeus, in which the goals of the philosophical life are intimately related to the study of the cosmos. Now, what I hope to have shown up to this point is that the classical Greek engagement with nature, while often touted as an ancestor to modern science, was in fact so imbued with theological and moral elements that, his identif that its identification with science, as we understand it, misses what for them was the central point of the study of nature. The modern concept science just doesn't work very well for this period. And it follows that commonly held views about the genealogy of modern science that see its birth in classical Greece and its demise with the rise of Christianity are simply mistaken. Now, having offered this very, once again, a, a very quick overview of this issue of what counts as ancient science, and it's much more complicated than the story I've just given you, um, I want now to turn to the question about religion in antiquity, and in particular, focus on the question of early Christian identity in relation to classical natural philosophy. So I've argued that there's not a recognisable science in antiquity, and now I'm going to argue that there's not a recognisable religion either, although the appearance of Christianity does bring something quite new, a kind of new conception of religiosity, and it actually lays the foundations for the conception of religion that will emerge in the 17th century. Now, I should say that my intention at this point is not to offer a comprehensive account of the identity of early Christianity, on which much has been written uh, by others who know much more than I, and indeed there are probably several in this room. Um, but I do want to pursue the question insofar as it's relevant to the claim I made last night about the fact that uh, there is no religion prior to the 17th century. And the story I want to tell is the story about the relationship between Christianity and the study of nature and how Christianity in the early modern period uh, becomes the model for a generic religion. So I'm going to be highly selective. I'm just going to start by looking at this text, which is a very interesting one in terms of understanding the identity uh, or, or how, how Christians understand their identity. And it's a second century uh, Christian letter and we can see here is the explanation for what Christianity is about. And let me, you can read it up there for yourselves. I'm not going to read it through. But let me highlight what, what the key points are when we're asking this question of what, what is the identity of early Christianity. So we have this notion of religion, worship, race, way of life. Um, this is not my translation, by the way. Um, I, th I think it's a pretty ancient uh, ancient one. But he, here are the relevant words, and I've just given you the dictionary definitions. Um, Theosabia, godliness, uh, Thraskia, religion, worship, uh, genos, race, um, uh, epiduma, practice, occupation. And in brackets I've given you the frequency with which they occur in the New Testament. Um, Thraski, you're probably familiar, the King James Version gives this in, 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 uh, in the epistle of James, true religion is, true religion and undefiled is, you know, to worship, to worship, to visit the fatherless and the widows and so on. So, so the, 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 this, this notion of that this is a true form of piety. Um, but you can see that these words don't appear that frequently except this one here, of course, but th this is a very generic term and it doesn't tend to appear in a religious context at all. Um, so, the general point here is that in, in none of these do we have anything that's a really direct equivalent to our conception of religion, despite two of the words here being actually translated as religion. The race one, I think, is the most interesting of these. So, I'm not going to give you an in-depth analysis of this passage, and there are many who've com commented on it, but as I said, I want to reinforce the fact that our category religion doesn't appear there. It doesn't seem to be available as a way for early Christians to identify themselves. Uh, and the other thing we find here is nonetheless a suggestion that with the appearance, with the advent of Christianity, we have the appearance of something quite new, 
not another species of a genus religion, but a new kind of genus altogether. A new kind of genus altogether. And it draws on existing models to some extent, but it's, it's something quite new. And what is this, what is the new conception that comes with early Christianity? And I think it turns partly on its universal claims, encapsulated in the Pauline formula, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Christianity thus conceived transcends the particularities of ethnicity, social status and gender. And this conceptualization of a religious way of life then that floats free from specific cultural contexts is quite new. Seth Schwartz has referred to this as a disembedding of religion, which simply means what I've just said, that it's, it transcends ethnicity and language. The Christian concept of a new race then is of a new kind of race, a race that in a sense is open to all. Um, it's important too that Christianity is not anchored to a particular geographical space. And again, this sentiment's found in the New Testament in John's Gospel, for example, where Jesus declares to the Samaritan woman that true worship will take place not in the temple cult located in Jerusalem or Mount uh, Gerizim, but in the hearts of believers who, quote, worship in spirit and in truth. Now, in this new form of religiosity, cultic practice uh, is interiorised so that the worshipper is not bound to a particular sacred place. And again, this is relatively new. Now, if Christian identity was novel in these respects, there were also significant continuities. So St Paul had identified the existing models in his observation that the Christian gospel was a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Greeks. And again, in the double negation, neither Jew nor Greek. Now, notice again that the categories to which Christianity is here compared are what we call ethnic categories. They're not religious categories. So, He's not negating, he's saying it's not Jewish religion or Greek religion, it's Jews nor Greeks. Now, while this oppositional motif, the neither nor, is undoubtedly present in the New Testament and certainly present in the Church Fathers, witness the frequently rehearsed reference of Tertullian that, that Christianity has nothing to do uh, with Athens. What has Athens to do with Jerusalem, says Tertullian. Uh, the first Christians, nonetheless, adopted quite positive understandings uh, of their relation to pagan culture and, and Jewish culture in certain respects. And the two most obvious models are the church as the new Israel or Christianity as the true philosophy. Okay, so we've had the negations, neither this nor that, but we also have some positive affirmation of elements of classical culture. And these designations then, both the negations and the positive ones, uh, reflect both continuity and change. So, just to, to sum up very quickly, what I hope should be apparent at this stage is that the first Christians do not, do not represent themselves as a new religion. They don't represent themselves as a new something that has existed before, but, and neither do they confront uh, pagan natural philosophy as science. In fact, as we will see, they confront pagan natural philosophy as a kind of competing spiritual practice. Now, to some degree, both existing faith traditions and Greek wisdom will be confronted as offering different versions of the goals of the spiritual life and the means to attain them. So that's the continuity element. So when we come to speak of the relationship between, say, Christians and Jews in the first century of the Christian era, we must immediately confront the fact that Jewish identity uh, was itself undergoing a profound trans uh, transformation. And this inevitably had an impact on Christian self-understandings. Indeed, arguably these changes would, would leave an indelible mark on the trajectory of Western culture. And two elements of the changes that uh, uh, Judaism is undertaking are of particular importance. And the first of these I've already alluded to, uh, and that's the mode of worship of the Jewish people. And the pivotal event here is the destruction of the temple by the Roman general Titus in AD 70. This event brought an end to the central ritual of first century Jewish culture. As my Oxford colleague uh, Guy Strumser has observed in a book appropriately entitled Religious, or subtitled I should say, Religious Transformations in Late Antiquity, he argues that with the cessation of the temple cult, Jews came to experience sacrifice internally in terms of metaphor and myth. This transition then contributed in a crucial way to what I've called the interiorization of 
religion. As we've already seen, this change is paralleled in that passage in John's Gospel, which was presumably written after the destruction of the temple. Worship is now an internal act, and this idea will be rehearsed 1,200 years later when Aquinas talks about religion as being primarily an interior act. The second thing we can say, and we're talking here about transformations of Judaism as they map across into Christianity. As a religion with a sacred book, Judaism contributes to the emergence of a textual culture and bequeaths to a fledgling Christianity the idea of a divine word in the canonical text. And while Judaism uh, itself was actually moving away from the written mode to the oral, Christianity aided by the new medium of the codex, new technology of the codex, which had begun to replace the more cumbersome scroll, placed a sacred text at the centre of its practices and its theological reflections. Now, this prioritisation of texts, together with a move towards the new interiority, is evident in changing reading practices, where we see a shift from public recitation to private meditative reading. These changes are evident in Augustine's autobiographical reflections and in the rise of the practice of silent reading. So recall how Augustine in the Confessions professes amazement when Ambrose is reading silently. Now, silent reading, um, he, Ambrose wasn't the first to do it, but nonetheless, the shift from public recitation to silent reading is an indication of the importance of the text and the interiority of religion. Now, so that's Christianity and Judaism. Turning to the question of the relation of early Christianity and classical culture, it's a huge topic in its own right. Um, so I'm going to be, once again, uh, resort to generalisations. It can be said that the philosophy of pagan antiquity also contributed to the model of Christian identity, specifically through the idea of Christianity as the realisation of the unfulfilled goals of pagan philosophy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, on this model, Christianity is understood to be the true philosophy. This claim is more easily comprehended once it's been understood that classical philosophy itself is less to do with doctrinal claims and more about spiritual formation. At least that's the claim I made earlier in the lecture. Now, with this in mind, we can see that the conflicting doctrines of pagan philosophies, to which Christian writers frequently allude, are less important than the overall aims of philosophical practice. So the practice is more important than the doctrines. Thus, while the putative deficiencies and contradictions of pagan philosophy are never forgotten, much of the content, is natural, much of, the content of natural philosophy is regarded as valuable because it helps in the true understanding of Scripture. Here again, the textual priorities of early Christianity. While the philosophical practices of ancient philosophy are themselves seen as aiming at the spiritual goals that only Christianity can offer access to. Okay, so the pagans are, as it were, grasping after something that only Christianity can fulfil. Now I'm going to offer some very brief and well-known examples of the Christian appropriation of the classical quest for wisdom. Justin Martyr, uh, a second century, was to describe philosophy, quote, as the greatest position and most honourable before God to whom it leads and alone commends us. Uh, and he refers to true holy men who have bestowed attention on philosophy. So these were the philosophers that had come before. Clement of Alexandria, uh, second and third century, in a similar vein, characterised philosophy as, quote, the work of divine providence and a handmaid to the Greeks. As the law had been to the Hebrews, so for the Gentiles, philosophy was a preparation for the gospel. Fellow Alexandrian Origen also thought that philosophy was a good preparation for Christianity and urged familiarity with the pagan sciences in order to assist Christian, the Christian, sorry, in order to assist Christian readers with their understanding of Holy Scripture. And Augustine, uh, fourth and fifth century, uh, frequently described Christianity, quote, as true philosophy and also insisted on the advantages of pagan learning for biblical exegesis. Now, all of this is relatively well known. Uh, in keeping, though, with this qualified endorsement of the goals of pagan philosophy, a number of church fathers commented on the received divisions of knowledge, the divisions of the sciences that we looked at earlier, insofar as these were thought to represent stages of spiritual development. At its most general level, these stages were thought of as representing a progression that moved from the contemplation of visible things to that is to say, natural philosophy, to invisible things, theological truths. 
So we can think of Anax Anaxagoras' formula, manifest things are a vision of hidden things, and this matches the cadence of St Paul's famous remark in Romans about since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen, being understood by the things that are from what has been made. Now, early Christian writers then adopted versions of the classical divisions of knowledge, but related them to the goal of theological contemplation as understood within the Christian tradition. Once again, the Alexandrian church fathers, Clement and Origen, treated the divisions of knowledge as stages on the path to contemplation of God and suggested that the Hebrew Bible had already anticipated the stages that we see uh, the Greek philosophers putting forward. So Clement says there are four divisions of Mosaic philosophy, the, the philosophy of Moses, historical, legislative, sacrifice and vision, and he maps these onto the categories of ethics, natural philosophy and theology. Clement also thought highly of geometry or mathematics, the science, quote, which leads us from things of sense to intellectual objects, or rather from these holy things to the holy of holies. So again, the idea of mathematics as a midpoint between the tangible, sensible things and the higher truths. Origen saw in the training of philosophers in Plato's Republic an educative process in which the novice passed through successive stages of ethics and mathematics before proceeding to theological contemplation. For him, this was an imitation of a parallel progression through the study of the wisdom literature of the Hebrew Bible. So here's Origen. Here are three divisions, ethics, natural philosophy, theology, which for Origen are represented in, respectively, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and then course, theology in the Song of Songs. Song of Songs, the most commented biblical text of the Middle Ages. Um, and of course, Solomon was regarded as the great natural philosopher, many of his books on natural philosophy having been lost. Now, these three stages are also then taken up uh, by those in monastic tradition. Uh, John Cassian, for example, suggested that these same three books represent three successive renunciations. Uh, the three speculative sciences of Aristotle, to cut a long story short, also find themselves mapped onto three stages of mystical theology, uh, Purgatio, Illuminatio and un uh, Unitio. Uh, and we find these Gregory of Nyssa, for example, identifies these three books and these stages as representing stages in the mystical quest. Now, a number of later Christian writers also drew these parallels, and so I don't multiply examples beyond necessity. Let me just use Augustine of Hippo, who, again, relatively well known. Augustine suggests that in different ways, Augustine follows the Stoic classification of the sciences. And he suggests that in different ways, the three branches of learning in Stoicism draw the individual towards God. So physics or natural philosophy is about God as the, the ultimate source of causation. Logic, God as a criterion of thought and ethics, God as the guide of proper conduct. Augustine also claimed that natural philosophy, moral philosophy and logic were all contained in Christ's commandment to love God and love neighbour. And this claim might sound a little bit far-fetched were it not for the, or the moral orientation of pagan philosophy. And interestingly, in the 17th century, as we'll see in Lecture 5, if you make it that far, the claim would again be made that natural philosophy is in essence about love of neighbour. Now, there's also a progressive element in Augustine's understanding of the divisions of knowledge. So he says the inquirer begins with a scientia of earthly things moving towards a sapientia or wisdom of heavenly things. So, says Augustine, we progress through knowledge towards wisdom. So scientia, the cultivation of which is promoted by natural philosophy, is a way station towards a progression or a way station in the progression towards Sapientia, the virtuous state of mind that was associated with theology. Even the most eminent of the heathen philosophers, Augustine explains, had failed to progress much beyond scientia. That was their problem. So the danger of natural philosophy was not to do with its content. It was to do with uh, the fact that uh, people may not, might not progress beyond uh, that stage. Um, now, if we consider then 
early Christian identity in relation to both the Jews and the Greeks, it can be seen that a dominant motif of that philosophy for the Greeks and the law for the Jews were a preparation for the gospel involve a mapping of some notion of fulfillment onto their respective histories. Thus, for example, there is an idea that the one true philosophy had existed since the creation and it had its counterpart in the idea of the true Christian religion being incipient in Judaism from its beginning. So from the promise given in Genesis 3.15, the faith of Abraham, the prescience of the Hebrew prophets, and so on. So says Ignatius, the prophets, quote, lived according to Jesus Christ. A similar idea is found in Tatian's contention that, quote, the philosophy of the Christians is more ancient than that of the Greeks. Both notions are, in a sense, further instances of this disembedding of Christian religion, in this case in relation to historical time. So Christianity floats free in time and can be extended back to the very beginning of history, laying claim to a lineage that begins with Adam and descends through both Jewish patriarchs and noble pagans. Its universality and potential inclusiveness extend temporally backwards and forwards in time, and this extension backwards provides an answer to the question posed by Diognetus, the very first passage I put up that we considered uh, right at the beginning of this discussion, why did the new race of Christians, Christians only appear now at this historical time? The answer was Christianity had not appeared now, Christianity had always been in existence, always been present. Now looking forward in time, this new mode of religiosity, this disembedded Christianity, is a precondition for the idea of a generic religion that will come into existence in the early modern period, as I spoke about last night. So this new kind of, this new genus of religion uh, appears in the first century and then establishes the precondition for the emergence of a fully fledged notion of religion of which Christianity is the paradigm case in the 17th century. Now, I'm going to conclude a somewhat long conclusion, so don't, don't relax too much. A three-page three conclusion. To sum up, I hope it's clear now that, that the category science and religion don't work that well for these earlier periods, and if we attempt to apply them in some rigid fashion, the result is a totally distorted picture. Even if we were to shoehorn the activities of the ancient world into our category, science and religion, as best we could, we still wouldn't get anything like the Karl Popper narrative that says we've got this rational science that falls in a hole because of Christianity and then it gets up and running again in the 17th century. Rather, what we see, if we care to look, is a natural philosophy that's always pursued with religious and moral <coughs> ends in mind. And we know this because the relevant historical actors say so. They tell us. Um, Christianity can thus, affirm, can thus affirm the ends of pagan natural philosophy. They, it can affirm its goals while denying that the means were appropriate or correct. And this realisation enables us to tell a rather different story about the commonly received narrative that, that I began with. And in conclusion, I think three aspects of this revised story are worth highlighting because they're only implicit at the moment. First, the idea that natural philosophy or science was subordinated to theology by the church fathers and after them by the scholastics, we see is clearly mistaken. As we've seen, it was Aristotle who placed theology, albeit in his own sense of the term, at the apex of the speculative sciences. And we should also recall that it's Plato who coins the term theology in the Republic. When in the Middle Ages, Aquinas subsequently declares theology to be, quote, the ruler or mistress of the other sciences, he does so in the context of a commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics and with the intention of representing the philosopher's perspective. The scholastics themselves were not even agreed about whether theology was a science, far less whether it was the queen of the sciences. So the idea that Christianity somehow bullied classical science and forced it into a position of subservience is false at a number of levels. Second, the second point of our conclusion to a degree, Christianity is responsible for a diminution of the scope of natural philosophy, for it begins to take over the moral and religious goals that were once intrinsic to the practice. 
So further developments in the early modern period and the 19th century will complete the process. But with the inception of Christianity, this evacuation of natural philosophy, of its spiritual elements, had already begun. So if we consider, for example, the uses of natural philosophy that we looked at earlier with Simplicius, here they are. What happens is that Christianity begins to take these over and it now starts to look like that's all that natural philosophy is about. Okay. So the tendency to, to distort the goals of ancient philosophy begins already when Christianity assumes to itself the, the goals of moral and spiritual formation that were once a part of the activity. So this then, the, the inception of Christianity is already a step in the direction of this, the demoralised and de-theologised version of natural philosophy that we call modern science. Third then, and related to this, the supposed opposition between naturalistic and theological accounts of the cosmos, often expressed in terms of Greek science versus Christian faith, is similarly misguided. Counterintuitive as it may seem, I would suggest that it's actually theological concerns that drive the agenda of naturalism. Now, this is explicit. Well, no, I'll forget Sophonies. Uh, this claim could be supported in a number of ways. I'll just give you a couple. Consider what the Christians did not believe in um, compared to their pagan contemporaries. They did not believe in astrology, magic, anthropomorphic deities, and the divinity of the heavens. On the last point, the divinity of the heavens, Jews, Christians, and Epicureans were virtually unique in the ancient world. And for Jews and Christians, of course, their disbelief in the divinity of the heavens was on theological grounds. Thus, for example, educated pagans like Celsus ridiculed Jews and Christians for not believing in the divinity of the stars. Partly on this account, Christians were often labelled as atheists and lumped together with the Epicureans, from whom, not surprisingly, they sought energetically to distinguish themselves. This difference persisted into later antiquity with the pagan Simplicius, that we've already considered, uh, being horrified with the blasphemy of the Christian philosopher Philoponus, uh, 490 to 570, who denied the divinity of the heavens. Now, as some of you know, Philoponus himself is a very interesting character, believing that the motion of the heavens was to be explained by a motive force imparted by God at the moment of creation. Indeed, he believed that all natural motion was thus imparted and may on this account be credited with having supposed a unified theory of dynamics. His conception of impetus may even have influenced Galileo. But that's another story. In sum, the Christian cosmos is not one inhabited by deities, but it does bear deep theological significance. Medieval Christians were to invest this depopulated world not with divinities, but with divine meanings. The premise was that nature was God's book. The rise and fall of this powerful metaphor, the book of nature, along with its implications for our modern conception science and religion, will be the topic of the next lecture. Thank you. Um, Professor Harrison, you meant you mentioned that um, the medieval scholastics could not agree on whether Christianity was a science, let alone queen of the sciences. Um, so where did these ideas come from and how common were they? Do you mean the idea that, that uh, theology was the queen of the sciences? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, as, as, um, as I think I explained, it's Aristotle who places theology at the apex of the three speculative sciences. And so when, a, when Aquinas is, is commenting on uh, uh, Aristotle's metaphysics, he m makes this observation about, whether, about, about theology at the apex of the speculative sciences. But as I say, there's not agreement about the scholastics that theology even is a science, or perhaps whether it's a speculative science or not was, was part of what was at issue. So, so Aristotle's distinction is that there are three speculative sciences, but there are also the practical science of ethics. And part of the issue for the scholastics was whether theology was a speculative science, 
uh, or whether it was a practical science, whether its aim was the love of God or whether it was wisdom. And so that, that's part of the discussion that's going on. The other complicating factor, of course, is that Aristotle's conception of, of theology or first philosophy is rather different to sacred science, which is what the scholastics talk about when they talk about theology. Um, Again, part of the background here is that theology is not a term that comes into much use until about the 12th and 13th centuries. So it's sacred doctrine, which is really the focus being scripture, rather than a kind of independent uh, science, as it, as it were. So it's a complicated question, but that's the, the general background. Um, but it's not the case that that scholastics uniformly claimed that theology was the queen of the sciences. And we need to, in any case, parse that very carefully because it depends on what you mean in this context by theology. It's, uh, it's taken me at least a day to come up with this question from your, um, in your lecture oh, yesterday. I'm a little slow. Um, <laughs> It, it crossed my mind that what you were talking about when you talked about the interiority of religion through to about the 17th century was that you're probably talking about an ideal type or a major trend. Uh, because it seems to me that even, uh, you know, in the fourth century, we have the creeds, we have early propositional yeah. um, statements coming, coming forth then. And of course, after the 17th century, you still have uh, movements within the Christian church which are very concerned with interiority, both among uh, the Roman church, but also among the Reformed church. Think of Methodism and so forth. Yeah. So I guess you were talking here about ideal types and major kind of streams of, of thought. Um, would you like to comment a wee bit about the early creeds and the propositions that, of course, included and excluded uh, certain ideas? Yeah, no, it's, it's an excellent question. I mean, let, let me take the, I'll answer the easy bit first. And that is to say, well, what happens to interiority in, in, uh, after the 17th century? And what I don't want to say is all of a sudden the whole of religion becomes externalised. What I want to say here is that in the 17th century we have a conception of religion and one dominant form of this is the notion that religion is constituted by, uh, by propositions and practices. But you're quite right to say there's a, there's a reaction against this where people say, no, religion is actually this. You know, so Schleiermark will say, you know, religion is, it's just gefool, etc., etc. But the, the point is that after this, we have a generic conception of religion however we want to populate it. And the question then becomes, how do we characterise this thing, religion? And that's not the question you can ask before the 17th century. So it's a, it's a, it's a very useful question to ask because I don't want to give the impression, which I did last night, that the only way of conceptualising religion after the 17th century is in terms of of beliefs and practices and the propositional thing is core because as you rightly point out there are discussions in about what constitutes it but these discussions are premised on the idea that there is something that is there to be constituted and that is this notion religion. Now the question about the creedal the, as you again as you rightly say what, what on earth are these councils all about if propositions aren't that important? Um, the, at some level clearly the propositions are important, um, and I'd say a couple of things on this. First, we know that to some degree the councils are politically motivated, and, and what the political motivation is intended to do is to bring a unity. Why? Because religion is the glue that... Religion, I, perhaps I shouldn't be using the term. What we need is something that's going to hold the empire together, and this is what politically motivates it. I think the other thing we can say about creeds, particularly uh, prior to the conciliar period, is that the creeds are important, but they're important, I think, as what we might call performative utterances, which is to say that, I mean, the classic, the, you know, the first formulation of a creed in the New Testament is, you know, the claim Jesus is Lord. Now, my claim here is that when, when that, 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 that utterance is less to do with asserting to a particular proposition. It's less about assenting to a proposition than a kind of commitment. And so, the point I'd want to make with creedal formulations is that if you consider them, particularly, say, in a liturgical context, what's going on in the recitation of a creed in that context? And I don't think it is purely giving assent to intellectual propositions. Um, okay. Hello. I asked a question yesterday, but um, I've got another one today. Okay. Uh, when you say that science um, didn't really get going until the 17th century, 
Um, how do you explain Copernicus, who wrote his book in the 16th century? And uh, although he was a Ptolemaic astronomer, he did say that it doesn't make sense for everything to be rotating around the Earth, and that mm -hmm. it made more sense for everything to rotate around the sun. Mm -hmm. And he did write it down, and yeah. it was published, and it was not banned for 30 years. So yeah. that was in the, in the 16th century. Yeah, I'm not saying science didn't begin until the 17th century, I'm saying it didn't begin until the 19th century, okay, because what's going on before then is natural philosophy, but Copernicus wasn't engaged in natural philosophy, he was engaged in mathematical astronomy, which was a, a, a rather different and somewhat, well, this is, this is part of the issue of what's happening with, subsequently with Galileo, but mathematical astronomy, which is, is, the, is the tradition that develops from Ptolemy, is about saving the appearances which is to say it's an instrumentalist model of understanding and predicting the motions of the heavenly bodies. But it's actually, in the Middle Ages, it was actually quite a distinct tradition from natural philosophy, which was an Aristotelian account of causally what was going on. And the difficulty was that they could never actually get these two together because the mathematical, the, the mathematical modelling was very difficult to provide physical accounts of. And so throughout the Middle Ages, you have this awkward situation where you have an instrumentalist uh, mathematical astronomy and a, and a kind of realist natural philosophy. So one's offering causal explanations, the other's offering mathematical models, okay? And so, so that's actually what's going on. Now, it's really only at Newton where you get these two brought together. And, and I put up the title of his book, last night so that you can see that he says he's doing natural philosophy but what's really interesting is that he says these are the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. This was very new because Newton was bringing together the two sciences that Aristotle had said were quite different because their objects were different, mathematics and natural philosophy. Okay, so now again it's confusing in the case of Copernicus because Copernicus should have been in the mathematical uh, instrumentalist school and the preface that Ossiander stuck on the front of it presents it in exactly that way. Don't believe any of this is true, he says. This is a mathematical construct. Okay? Whether Copernicus himself believed that, I don't know. Uh, this is in part of the trouble that Galileo gets into because the question for Galileo is, are you giving us a mathematical model, the heliocentric, or are you claiming that this is the true version? And, and Galileo says, no, it's not just a mathematical model, I'm claiming it's true. And again, this was part of what got him into trouble because not merely was he coming up with a new theory, he was actually making a claim about the status of mathematical uh, astronomy, saying this actually is giving us a real philosophical account of how it works. And those two enterprises were at that time quite separate. So again, it's a very complicated business, but that's why science is not going to do the trick. We need to understand what ma na natural philosophy is, what mathematical astronomy is, and why they're quite distinct, or were quite distinct then. So I'm still a little bit unclear about your definition of science, because mm -hmm. the view that I generally take is that it's really just the best current explanation. So in Copernicus's case, his mathematical was the best explanation of the, pheno the phenomena that was seen and so even though he couldn't for religious reasons accept that I would still say well that's science with observation and the best explanation. So could you define science for me because I don't feel like we've really said what science is. Ah well <laughs> no I mean I did, for me to be honest science is what scientists do um, and, and I, I think part of the uh, you know, part of the trick has been um, to, uh, that, that we still have a range of quite diverse activities that fall under the umbrella science. And again, the history is crucial here because, you know, we, I, I've talked here about the distinction between a mathematical astronomy and, an, and, and a, a physical causal natural philosophy. And you can add another one in here, natural history, which is a historical account based on, uh, you know, factual. Now, we fudge all of that in our contemporary scientific conceptions because we have historical sciences like cosmology or evolutionary accounts of history. We have physics. And the idea is that, that these somehow have something in common by virtue of this label science is what's deeply 
problematic, I think. So the, so the whole conception is one that I'm really wanting to pull apart. You're asking me to put it together. No, I'm not going to do that. So if you're puzzled about what science is, good. That's, that's the way you ought to be thinking. I'm personally not puzzled. Oh, you're not I'm puzzled. puzzled. Okay. Maybe I'm the one who's confused I'm very there. very clear about that. Ah. But I should, I mean, just to say on the Copernicus thing, Copernicus doesn't have an explanation. He has a mechanism of prediction. Okay. He's got no idea how any of that can work. And in terms of the physics, it can't work. Right. That's, that's part of the difficulty. No, it saved, no, it wasn't. Actually, it saved the appearances to a certain extent. It saved them about, that is to say, it gave predictability about as well as the Ptolemaic model did, right? It was simpler. In certain respects, it was more elegant, right? But he's still got circular orbits, for example. And he has no, no concept of how physically this can work, right? Even Galileo struggled with that. Newton comes up with, with gravity eventually. And is gravity an explanation? Well, Again, not, not, not clear. So the question is, what counts as an explanation, right? Right, I've just got a quick, quick question. Uh, in your opinion, do you think that uh, religion might have been actively formed as like a way of controlling the population in general? Ah, well, this is an old Greek idea about, <laughs> about religion. Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it, it, certainly religion can be used for that purpose, but I don't think that's going to give an account of the... Uh, the origin of religion. I mean, again, I wouldn't want to deny that, that you know, it's, it, it's conceivable that religion could, could be used for that purpose. But, um, I mean, historically, religion seems to me have been so subversive often of political process um, that it, it just cuts both ways. But it is, I mean, the, the, uh, the imposture theory is, is a, cl a classical Greek theory of religion and of the origin of religion, or at least of the maintenance and persistence of religion. So that's floating around there as a kind of theory of religion. I don't place much store in it, personally. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, all of you for your questions. Um, I just want to uh, again remind you of uh, the next lecture will be uh, Thursday of this week. Uh, and uh, then, uh, again, reminding you of a uh, week Thursday, uh, the discussion session we held at the University of Chaplains. We've had a very stimulating lecture. Obviously, the questions could have gone on further. Will you join me in giving a vote of thanks to you for this? This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.